So what is toxic empathy? Toxic empathy is a tool of emotional manipulation into believing the progressive perspective is the compassionate and loving one. It's sort of like who can outdo each other in being nice today. Yeah. And niceness isn't always what's loving. The question has to be not how do you feel or how does that person feel? It's not necessarily unimportant, but it's incomplete. The question is what is true and what is right. To decide that, you have to look at what is scientifically, factually true, historically true, but most important for the Christian, what is biblically true. I have seen toxic empathy, certainly on the left, and I'm seeing it on the right. Trans women are women is the same math as love is love because you're refusing to define what those things are. It's just a secular mantra that can mean anything you want it to mean. Adoption redeems an already broken situation, whereas surrogacy, ag selling, sperm selling creates that broken situation. It's a massive social experiment that has never been done before in the history of humanity. This Christless, secular, conservative movement that we have, at the end of the day, that's going to wash away like everything else because it's not anchored. Ali Stuckey, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. It was so fun having you on earlier this year. Yes, I know. I always love to be here. We were talking about motherhood and women stuff. Yes. All of that. All the good stuff. And I just saw your girls recently. They're all beautiful. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, and you're, fun. you're coming out with a book. In yes. fact, when we're filming this, it's I think a week before D-Day for the book, but the book's out now, right? Yes. Toxic Empathy, How Progressives Exploit Christian Compassion, which everyone says that's a very like zingy title. I don't know if I necessarily meant it to be, but I guess it does kind of grab people's attention just because we only hear empathy talked about in positive terms, which is why I wrote the book. So what is toxic empathy? Toxic empathy is a tool of emotional manipulation that is, I would say, primarily used by the left simply because progressivism controls most of the media, most of the channels of information and communication and influence that we have. And so they use this tool to manipulate, I would say in particular women, I guess you could say everyone, but even more specifically Christian women into believing that the progressive perspective on a particular issue is the compassionate and loving one. And there's a formula they follow to, to use this, to employ this tactic basically on every subject. They'll hoist up a particular victim. They'll tell you their heartstring pulling story, and they will lead you either explicitly, uh, explicitly or implicitly to conclude that affirming this person's choice, affirming this person's feeling is the righteous and moral and compassionate position. And so you're left with thinking, well, the only loving thing to do the truly empathetic thing to do because I feel how this person feels, the story has put me in their shoes, is to affirm whatever choice they want to make. Affirm their choice to abort their child, affirm their choice to quote unquote change their gender, affirm their choice to marry whomever they please, affirm their choice to cross the border illegally, um, affirm the lawlessness that I see promoted by social justice ideology, all because you feel that you are helping the least of these. And we'll get into it, but this is actually, the reason I call it toxic is because this strategy blinds you to both reality and morality. The truth is on every side of the issue, there are people that are affected. There's people that could be hurt on the immigration issue, on the abortion issue. It's not just the person that the media hoists up as the victim. There are other people who are affected by whatever policy or ideological position we hold. And so when we're looking at people on both sides of the issue and both people evoke our compassion and empathy, the question is, especially for the Christian, well, what do we do? which is why we can't be led by empathy because if we have empathy for everyone, we're constantly just in our puddle of emotions and we don't know what to do. We can't make a policy decision, which is all about trade-offs anyway. So the question has to be not how do you feel or how does that person feel? Because that can only get you so far. It's not necessarily unimportant, but it's incomplete. The question is what is true and what is right. And so 
to decide that, you have to look at what is scientifically, factually true, historically true, but most important for the Christian, what is biblically true. And what is biblically true is not always going to feel good to every party involved, but what is biblically true is always the most loving thing because love and empathy are not the same. Empathy is a feeling, but love seeks what is best for someone as God defines best. And that's really not a matter of emotions. That's a matter of righteous perspective, but also action. Such a good point. I think with the empathy topic, empathy is important. It is important to be inside someone else's shoes. But like you're saying, feelings are not the definitive end of anybody. And also sometimes your feelings might happen and you still have to do the, the tough thing or the hard thing. Right. I think about like the obvious case of an example of someone who is committing crimes, you know, stealing or being violent against someone in public, you can have empathy for them and still recognize they're a threat to themselves and others and they need to be probably in prison, yeah. you know, that depending on the circumstances or a mental ward, if it's a mentally unstable moment. And what's most loving for that person as the aggressor in that scenario is to actually remove them from a place where they're harming themselves or others. So that you know, you could call that maybe tough love, but that is ultimately loving. Mm -hmm. That is the most loving thing that you can do. Yeah. So I think this is often lost in our conversations about public policy is that sometimes the tough love thing for the sake of that person and for the other people who might be endangered is the right decision. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to start with your, back to your title, which is a great title, by the way, the, t the idea of toxic empathy is a really important one because it, it's sort of like who can outdo each other in being nice today. Yeah especially for women, like, we, oh, I'm so nice. No, you're so nice. And niceness isn't always what's loving. Mm -hmm. But you talk about progressives. I'm going to start with that because I have seen toxic empathy, certainly on the left, and I'm seeing it on the right. Mm -hmm. And particularly right now, we're in an election cycle. There's a lot of toxic empathy on the issue of abortion, Yeah, where you're seeing people on the right right politicians, like right now the Trump campaign, who, I mean, J.D. Vance, even in the vice presidential debate last week, he was saying that we need to be more understanding of women basically who have abortions. Gain their trust. Gain their Whatever trust as means. if as if being pro-life means you are violating someone's trust. I mean, that was right. the implication that was so bad there is that you're pro-life, you are opposed to the killing of children. You, you know abortion's not good for women, even if it's what society is telling them is good. And, but J.D. Vance made this comment about some, you know, a girl that he knew that was in an abusive relationship. She had an abortion and basically it was like a concession, like, okay, those who support abortion, I, 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 we need to be more understanding because in tough situations, it's what's good for the woman. Because he was saying in this story, this woman told him it was what was good for her. Mm -hmm. Have you seen this happening more in the right? Yeah. What is your take on all of that? Well, it is still progressivism exploiting Christian compassion or conservative compassion because the toxic empathy that we see on the right typically manifests itself in more progressive policy positions. And so- So they're just becoming progressive in on, your view. On, the, yeah. on this issue, mm -hmm. certainly, because they are buying into the pro-choice premise. The entire pro-choice premise is that abortion is different than other kinds of killing for whatever reason, because the baby is small, because of the location, because of the age, because of the size. And so as soon as you start to admit, well, sometimes abortion is okay. Sometimes it is right to kill the child. Sometimes it is more about what the mother needs in that particular situation. Sometimes the circumstances of conception are so bad that abortion is fine. Well, then you've just basically conceded everything. You've conceded to their premise that abortion is the justified, in some cases at least, killing of an innocent person. And so you basically agree with them on the foundations of the pro-abortion position that life inside the womb isn't just like any other life, that it really is less than, that it really does, it it really doesn't have the same value. And therefore we have to make exceptions for babies inside the womb, their killing that we would never make for people outside the womb. And once you've got that, like what's stopping you from, from being pro-choice in any other regard? And it is toxic empathy because it is forcing you to only focus on the plight or the purported plight of the mother. And in the first chapter, and this was the, I mean, it was a difficult chapter to write just because of the brutality of abortion, but it was also the easiest to write just because of how passionate I am about it and how black and white I really think this issue is. But at the start of every chapter, we tell a toxic empathy story that has been told by say NPR or the Washington Post, or maybe a story that most people are familiar with 
uh, in the news. And we tell it in a compelling way. Like I wanted to tell it in a way that would pull on someone's heartstrings so that at the end of the story, they think, well, maybe I am pro-choice because this was a horrible story. So Mm -hmm. we tell this uh, story of Samantha and Halo Castellano. And this was a report that was uh, that was originally written in the Washington Post or actually in NPR a couple of years ago to try to explain why these pro-life laws in Texas are so awful. And Halo uh, was a baby who was diagnosed at the 20-week ultrasound with uh, trisomy 18, which of course can be a life-limiting diagnosis, but she, her mother, Samantha, wasn't able to get an abortion in the state of Texas because of the pro-life laws that had been passed after the Dobbs decision. And so they were forced, according to NPR, to have this baby full term, to pay for a funeral, even though their family was poor. Mm -hmm. And the story talks about how grueling it was, how painful it was to be in labor for so many hours, knowing that your baby is going to die in your arms. So at the end of it, you're thinking, oh, I can't believe this poor woman, Samantha, and her poor family and her poor children were forced to endure such hardship because of course, absent in this storytelling is the life of this child and her dignity and her rights and her personhood and her humanity absent from this story is what a 20 week abortion would have looked like, would have felt like, would have sounded like. What was absent from this story is the alternative reality in which Halo, instead of being born whole and loved and cared for and held by her mom and dad after birth, would have been ripped apart and discarded like trash. Of course, NPR isn't going to tell that side of the story because they only want you to feel for Samantha. They only want you to feel for the mom. They don't want you to think about the other part of this moral equation, the other calculation that's at play. Um, And so in the, in the chapter, that's what we do after we end that story, we say, okay, but let's tell this another, let's tell this another way. Let's tell it from the perspective of Halo and what would have happened to her if she had been aborted. And we walk through what an abortion looks like at this stage, which of course your viewers and listeners know very well because of live actions resources And then we go into not only medically what an abortion is, but what's the history of abortion? We look at the antinatalist movement all the way back to Thomas Malthus and the Nazi ties with Margaret Sanger and the eugenicist society and how really Planned Parenthood is still carrying out that mission to this day. And we also really get into in every chapter, we look at how the church and specifically evangelicals, because that's the group I'm a part of how people in my camp have really equivocated on each of these issues, but especially this issue, the holistically pro-life or pro-all life, which sounds good, but typically those who take this position, even professing Christians, they'll say, well, I'm pro-all life, which is why I vote Democrat, because I care about the border, I care about racism, I care about social justice. And so they'll say, you know, we really shouldn't focus on making abortion illegal. We should only focus on making it unthinkable. And how we do that is increase welfare or increase these government programs or increase access to birth control or comprehensive What's sex What's so ed. crazy is we have more of those programs than ever before in human history or American history and the abortion rates going up. Right. Which is devastating. Yeah. And so I'm not saying there's a direct causation there, but I will say I have seen again and again in this movement, you need material resources. That's why we're big champions of the Pregnancy Resource Center movement. That's why we love and support getting the woman the support that she needs and deserves, not just before birth, but after birth. But even with all the material goods that may be available, if there is a mindset that I can't do this, that I don't want to do this, that this baby is a threat to my empowerment, my achievement, whatever it is, you could hand out, you know, your diapers are taken care of, here's housing, like here's all of these needs that we can meet for you. And it won't be enough Yeah, for a lot of people. A a, a lot of people who justify however they vote or justify their opposition to securing the legal right to life Mm -hmm. for unborn children by saying, well, we just need to do more. I always ask, when's the last time you donated your time or your treasure to your pregnancy center? What's the name of the pregnancy Mm -hmm. center in, in your area? 
Most of them don't even know that pregnancy centers exist or they've imbibed this propaganda that they're fake clinics just lying to women, which of course is not true at all. And so if you are concerned that women don't have enough resources, it's time to get up and do something about that. Do not delegate the compassion that God has called you to, to the government, because with the government, there's always going to be a trade-off. It's never charity from the government. There's always some kind of exchange there. So there have, you know, there's Christians who have been doing that work that pro-choicers say need to be done before they can be pro-life for decades and decades. So you can be a part of that, or you can complain and continue to vote for the people who believe in the slaughter of unborn children through all nine months. A big thank you to our sponsor, GoodRanchers.com. Good Ranchers is American meat delivered. Did you know that up to 90% of the meat in your grocery store is not from the United States? It might say USA on the label, but it's not actually from American Ranchers. It's imported and packaged in the United States. Good Ranchers is 100% sourced from the United States. And when you choose GoodRanchers.com, you're choosing more than just delicious meat. You're choosing to support local American farms and ranchers, standing up for transparency and safety in our food supply. At my house, chicken nuggets are an easy and kid-friendly meal, but I'm concerned about the seed oils and the additives in the brands that we purchase at the grocery store. Thankfully, Good Ranchers has created a new seed oil-free nugget. No other nugget on the market offers a pure seed oil-free recipe that prioritizes your family's health without sacrificing flavor or crunch. And right now, if you subscribe at GoodRanchers.com, for a limited time, you can get a free add-on for a full four years or until the next presidential election. That means that when you subscribe to any of the Good Ranchers boxes, you get to decide if you want free chicken breast, Angus ground beef, applewood smoked bacon, or wild caught salmon in every one of your orders for four years. So go to GoodRanchers.com today. Use my code Lila at checkout to get up to $1,200 of free add-ons. That's GoodRanchers.com, American meat delivered. All right. So another topic that you get into in the book is sexuality issues. Mm -hmm. And you actually have two chapters about this. One is on LG and uh, LGB. Yeah. Uh, LG, well, LGB. <laughs> yeah. And then the last is on T. Yeah. I want to do the, and this is obviously highly controversial today. I think in some ways it's more controversial to be for natural marriage than it is to be pro life. Mm. in some parts of our society. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I think you did a great job of exposing the lies of the toxic empathy used on sometimes both sides to justify killing innocent babies. It's never yeah. loving to kill a baby, full stop. Let's talk about the sexuality issues because I do think there's a ton of emotional hijacking that happens there. Yes. And, you know, I, I'm going to start with one that was really controversial. Um, and I know you address this with reproductive technologies in your book, but when you have these public figures come out and talk about their adoption stories and they're in same-sex relationships. And so they're either doing surrogacy and IVF or there's adoption, but often it's surrogacy and IVF to have children. And people who say, well, a ch child deserves a mother and a father. When at all possible, let them have a, a mother and a father. That's an irre Those are irreplaceable roles. It's not that mm -hmm. everyone has them because of loss or death or even mm -hmm. God forbid abuse, but that's maximally good for kids. Mm -hmm. And so when you you know, especially if you're bringing life into the world intentionally through IVF and surrogacy only to deny that child of a mother or a father because they're being placed with the same sex couple, there is all this empathy for the same sex couple, right? In modern yeah. society. Well, of course they should have the right to have children. How dare you? This child is going to do great. The child's fine. It's not a big deal. You address some of this. What is your take on that? Yeah, there's something uh, called the family diversity theory. And I heard about it first from Dr. Brad Wilcox. He's mm -hmm part of the Family Institute at the University of Virginia. And it's mm -hmm. this theory that children just need love. And it doesn't matter who it's from. They, it could be aunts and uncles. It could be some kind of strange polycule situation. It could be two men. It could be two women. It could be a single parent. As long as they are loved and cared for, as long as they have material resources, mm -hmm. they're not abused, they're not in severe poverty, they'll be fine. But that's not actually what the data bears out at all. The data bears out that a child, even in an imperfect home, mm -hmm. feels most stable and most secure, most emotionally healthy when they're with their biological mom and dad. And as you said, are there exceptions to that? Of course, we're not advocating for a child to stay in an abusive home. But statistically, this is what is healthiest for the child. And 
obviously that makes sense. The two components that are made to make a child are also needed to raise a child. It's a very anti-science, pseudo-religious, superstitious position to say, you need a sperm and an egg, a man and a woman, every single person on earth needs that in order to exist. But then one of those components or one of those Mm -hmm. people all of a sudden becomes replaceable or arbitrary. And here's the thing, because we have people who are part of the LGB that are like, well, I don't agree with the T, but homosexuality and gay so-called marriage is completely different. It's not. It's the same math. Trans women are women is the same math as love is love because you're refusing to define what those things are. It's just a secular mantra that can mean anything you want it to mean. It's just as absurd. And you are saying essentially, just as transgenderism says, well, basically a woman can be anything that you say, anyone that declares it. Well, the gay union movement or gay marriage movement is saying a mother can be anything that you say that it is. A father can be anything that you say that it is. These aren't real fixed biological categories. These are social categories that we can kind of just change. I think it is one of the cruelest crimes against humanity that we are purposely creating and raising motherless and fatherless children. I mean, there's a reason why in the Bible, fatherlessness is exclusively a category of vulnerability. Christians are called to take up the cause of the fatherless. And yet when it comes to reproductive technology, when it comes to two women raising children, we don't think of that. We don't think of those as vulnerable children that we're supposed to be carrying the mantle for. But I mean, there's a reason why the Bible doesn't really talk about motherless children because it's unnatural. Mm -hmm. It is so against how God created us. And it's such a historical aberration because mothers very rarely abandon their children. And yet right now we are not only celebrating that in the name of empathy and love, we're subsidizing it through IVF and especially in the state of California. Um, And I think those chickens will come home to roost at some point, and it's frightening to think about what that will look like. It's a massive social experiment that has never been done before in the history of humanity. What politics, a combination of, of politics, we can call it progressive politics, and reproductive technologies has created, where there's a whole generation of kids that are intentionally being separated from their biological parents, not because of loss or abuse, but because of the choices yeah, the commodification of the creation of new life. Yep, and there's so little regulation of any of it. Of course, yeah. we, you know, you've talked about this so many times in your show. You've been so amazing about that, Ali, talking about reproductive technologies and the harm of IVF. But there's a whole generation of kids that are having a massive social experiment performed on them, yeah. and they're and they're being told that you do not need a mother or you do not need a father, that you should be happy because you're being gaslit. They're being gaslit. Yes. And Katie Faust, who you've talked about, she has them before us. And she highlights a lot of the testimonies of these kids who are told by their peers, told by their teachers, told by their counselors, their therapists and their parents. No, you don't really want a mom. No, you know, some people have bad moms. No, you're, aren't you happy? Look at everything that you have. Look at how much they love you. Look at everything they went through to have you in the IVF process. Mm -hmm the egg selling, the womb renting process, which is a whole other horrific side of the surrogacy um, aspect of all of this. And so even children are being told, no, I know you feel like there's something missing. I know you're feeling like you were abandoned and you want to know half of your DNA. Mm -hmm. I know that you long for that love of your mother, but you don't really need it. Um, I don't know if you saw Lance Bass. He was, you know, the NSYNC singer and he is with a man and they did the whole surrogacy process to have children. And he actually confessed in an article when he was being asked about fatherhood, he said, you know, it was so hard. And the first year of their life, they wouldn't cuddle with us. They never wanted to snuggle with me. And yet when my mom came over, it was immediate. They just gravitated toward her. That's so sad. Yes, because God created us physiologically to need our moms. And, you know, I, I always get asked, well, what about adoption? Are you Mm -hmm. saying that that's, well, I am saying, of course, that adoption is not the ideal, but adoption redeems an already broken situation, whereas surrogacy, egg selling, sperm selling creates Mm -hmm. that broken situation. And through toxic empathy, we're only looking at, well, they really want a baby. They really want a baby, whether it's a same-sex couple or like, you know, a heterosexual couple that's 
using reproductive technology, we never think about the babies on the other side of the equation. We only think about who the media says are the victims, and that's the parents wanting a child. Such a good point. I remember seeing a co comment or a short video, Khloe Kardashian, after yes. undergoing surrogacy, admitting that she didn't feel she could connect with her baby afterwards, like it wasn't her baby. She and didn't even come get her baby. The doctor that delivered the baby said, I'll take the baby home for the weekend because you're busy, you're out of town. I mean, that's commodifying, you're objectifying your child in a way. It's like, oh, let me put that dress on hold. I can't get it right now, I'll come get it later. I mean, and those first few moments of that child's life where it's so important to connect, those are gone forever. There is part of the, I think, toxic empathy narrative too is so many people I think are struggling with their sexuality and there's real struggles happening yeah. and there's real questions that are happening. And some people, they believe they find a sense of community relief and freedom yeah. when they are in what is called today, you know, in our kind of colloquialism, LGBTQ plus IA, whatever community, they feel that they've finally found people that understand them, that affirm them. And I think it is part of the human condition to, to some degree, wrestle with sexuality or sexual uh, it, uh, attraction and this doesn't go away just because you're hetero, you know, in terms yeah. of you're hetero and you might have interest in someone you're not married to, or maybe before you get married, you're sexually attracted to someone that doesn't mean you should act on those sexual attractions. So the whole, the whole rubric for how to think about sexuality has been flipped on its head today. Yeah. And so now, you know, you are your desires, your desires mm -hmm. are a core part of your identity. And if you can't act out in your desires within the reason of, you know, it has to be between consenting adults. That's a kind of the, the bedrock now of any sexual ethics. Yeah. Then if you can't do that, then you are oppressed. You are shamed. You yes. are hurt. So yes. you address some of this in toxic empathy. Yeah. How did you navigate that? Because it's so highly, I think, it's so painful for a lot of people who feel like they yeah. are being erased if yes. they're told by others that, you know, you're, you are not your sexual attractions. Mm -hmm. That was a perfect explanation of the framing that I think has gotten us there. This idea that our feelings are who we are. They are our identity. And if you don't affirm my feelings, if you don't have that, not only empathy, feeling how I feel, but through your empathy, affirm everything I feel, then you are denying my value as a person. You don't love me. You hate me. You're trying to oppress me. And when we go through this particular chapter, when it's talking about sexuality, both in the gender and sexuality, but in the homosexuality chapter, we go through the story of Glennon Doyle, who is a very famous author. She's written a few books and all of them have just sold a, a ton of copies, like millions of copies. And she was a Christian mommy blogger and she wrote about the hardship of motherhood and marriage and how her husband had been unfaithful, but she wrote Love Warrior and she was going to stick it out. And then one day she announced that through all of this, she was actually getting a divorce. People felt betrayed, but that she had actually fallen in love with a woman. Well, it was her book. I think was it Love Warrior that had come out. They were selling the book and it was about her finding redemption with her husband and being faithful to him, even in his infidelities and them finding a new marriage, basically. Yeah. And literally, as they were selling that book, I think she made the announcement, I'm leaving him, actually, and I'm marrying a woman. Yeah. By any standard, it's so confusing. The message is, fight yeah. for your marriage, even in the face of you know significant betrayals. And then he had, I guess, restored and started fighting for it, too, according to her book. And then there's this very public betrayal of her vows. And then a step further there was now I'm going to enter another marriage, but this time with someone of the same sex. Yep. And how she describes it is just, I felt like me for the first time. I was liberated. I felt like my true self. I felt like I've never felt before. And now the picture that she paints is one of complete and total happiness that our whole family gets along so well. My kids have so many people to love them and it's just perfect and we're so happy together. And I think most people hear that and they're like, well, how does that really affect me? If she's happy, if she's being her true self, she's not hurting anyone and it works for them, then what's the problem? And maybe that is true for most people, how you know they see things, but it can't be true for the Christian because 
while you may be able to feel how they feel and understand or sympathize with the hardships that she went through, if you understand that God is love, 1 John 4, 8, and that love rejoices with the truth, 1 Corinthians 13, 6, then you know that you cannot really love someone by disagreeing with God. You can't really love someone by opposing what he says is good and right and true. You can't really love someone and want what's best for them by looking at the creation account, all of the answers that are given to us in Genesis 127 about the definition of marriage and say, mm -hmm. okay, God doesn't know what he's talking about. The God who is love, who created our bodies, who created marriage to be an earthly reflection of Christ and the church. I think I'm a little better than that. I think I'm kinder than God. I think I'm nicer than God. I think I'm more compassionate than God. And I can be happy for this person who is opposing what God says is good, right, and true and affirm what they're doing and still consider myself kind. Well, you might have toxic empathy, but you don't have love and kindness as God defines it because you can't be truly loving and kind and oppose what God says is true. And then of course, the implications of redefining marriage for society and for children, the unconsenting subjects of this social experiment, as you articulated, they're just massive. And then we also talk about, and Rosaria Butterfield really challenged me on this because I had such a hard time for a while understanding, okay, but how should my belief about this affect the public sphere? Because I remember when I talked to Dave Rubin a few years ago on his show, and I shared my perspective on LGBTQ. And he was like, yeah, you know, I'm fine with people believing what they believe as long as they don't believe that my marriage should be illegal. And I'm like, well, okay. Well, and I have to, <laughs> I have to note here too, but we're talking about progressivism kind of entering conservatism mm -hmm. increasingly. And that's not just on life. Mm -hmm. It's definitely on marriage. Totally. They did take natural marriage out of the Republican party party's platform yeah. just a couple months ago. This was a big deal. I mean, it had been natural marriage in there for years and years and years, and now it's removed. So mm -hmm. this is kind of what we're seeing, unfortunately, on the right with this embrace of live and let live. Love is love. You know, there's not one good path for children, it, any family, any shape of family. I think right now the new boundary alley is like, it has to be one man, it has to be one, you know, two adults, yeah. right? So like for now, there, that's it can be two women, it can be two men. And that's kind of the boundary of marriage. But California is looking at enshrining in the state constitution, a complete erasure of the definition of marriage. So no longer is it even two consenting adults. It could be four consenting adults, five mm -hmm. consenting adults. And some people say, well, that's not a big deal. That's only going to be a fringe amount of people anyways. But when you make, when you ratify, when you make a right to marriage and you redefine it as anything but a man and a woman, there are going to be people affected, the generation of children that will be affected one yes. way or another. You can't, help. this is not just about what adults do in their bedroom. This does affect children because necessarily it gets into adoption and reproductive technologies that Which in California, you're now, you're subsidizing that too. It's so it's subsidized. You're not just for, in for, your bedrooms, you're yes. in our pocketbooks. And mm -hmm. I mean, you're, you're in our churches too, this ideology anyway, that's asking us not only to affirm, but also to mm -hmm. celebrate and pay for it. And so it was always a lie that you could redefine something as existential, fundamental, and cohesive as marriage and that it wouldn't affect anyone else. Even statistically, the most dangerous person to a child, statistically, again, there's always exceptions to, uh, to statistics, but the most dangerous person to a child's physical well-being is the unrelated person in their house, whether it's a step parent or whether it is another family member or family friend. The further degrees of separation that you get from a child um, and the closer you are in proximity to that child, the more in danger that child statistically is. So when you think about these polycule situations where you have multiple unrelated and many times sexually confused adults all in one place with these vulnerable children, that is a recipe for disaster. But that's what toxic empathy does. We only are supposed to think about what do adults want? What does this person want? And what that person wants goes. And whoever pays the price on the other side of it really doesn't matter. Do you think that the message that you, when you share, when you speak about this, and I know you, you've talked about this on the podcast many times, and you've got millions of people who have listened and listened to your show, 
do you feel like you've made pro you can make progress on this one? Because I think there's also a new narrative that you can't make progress on the sexuality issues. That if people have attractions a different direction, you know, if they're confused sexually or they have these sexual attractions or identify a certain way, that's just the way it's going to be. And society better just learn how to live with each other. Like li the live and let live message. Mm -hmm. Of course, children are this unfortunate group that just get left in the lurch of this. Uh, what do you, what are you seeing out there? Hmm. I, I'm seeing some hope, but I want to, I'm curious yeah. what you're seeing. Did you know that every year, 200,000 families go bankrupt from medical bills, even with health insurance. For many people, insurance is simply not working for them. That's why I'm excited to share with you about Crowd Health, which is an alternative model for paying for your healthcare. Crowd Health takes your bills, personally negotiates them on your behalf, and then sends out a request to the community to help cover your bills. The Crowd Health community has fully funded more than 5,000 medical bills over the last two years. This includes accidents like a young woman in Tennessee who lost her fingers in a boating accident, to NICU babies and cancer cases. Keep in mind, crowd health is not the same thing as insurance, but it is an alternative model to help pay medical bills and keep your monthly costs low. So go to join crowd health today, use the code Lila at checkout to get your first three months for only $99. That's joincrowdhealth.com and use the code Lila at checkout to get your first three months for only $99. Joincrowdhealth.com. Well, I did see that actually support for a gay marriage has the trend has actually reversed for the first time in like 20 years That's among huge. Gen Z, which is really, really interesting. It's so interesting. Um, and of course, individually, I hear stories all the time, as I'm sure you do, of people changing their own hearts and minds on things like abortion or things like gender. I had this beautiful young woman named Daisy Strong and come on my show, mm -hmm. and she was a part of the Prager U documentary about detransitioning. And she had reached out to me and said, you know, I transitioned when I was about 19, 20 years old after I had a lot of people via toxic empathy feel for me and affirm me even when her frontal lobe wasn't developed. And she said during this time that I transitioned, I started listening to some right wing things, mostly because I had seen some of your names on Reddit and I just... I was kind of Reddit, hate listening and hate watching and I would argue with mm -hmm. you guys. And she said, but every time you would talk about gender, I couldn't formulate mm. my arguments. And that's not me taking credit. It's really just a basic biological observable, observable fact, the difference between male and female. She was like, I kept on trying to argue and I couldn't argue. And so it wasn't, of course, just my content. It was several other people, but over time and through God working in her heart, she was like, I can't do this anymore. This is a lie. I'm never really going to be a man. She detransitioned and now she is married and a mother of two and a Christian. And it's a really beautiful story. But to me, you know, I can get really discouraged when I look at the big picture um, or when I look at the medium picture, because the big picture is that God is in charge and that his eternal plan of redemption is going off without a hitch and he's going to find all of his lost sheep because God never fails. That's the big picture. And the small picture mm -hmm. is that everyone's mind and heart is going to change whom God sets out mm -hmm. to change. And that is something you and I get a front row in seeing, and I get those messages all the time. The medium picture is what is discouraging. The stuff that you see on social media, the stuff that you see on your timeline, that everything is going to hell in a handbasket and everyone is just sufficiently propagandized into believing that abortion is okay, that you can switch genders that family structure doesn't matter, open borders is fine, and all of that. Um, and the medium scale matters. The medium picture matters. It can determine elections, but it is not the ultimate form of reality, and it's not what we can focus on every second of every day because it will demoralize us. I heard this a couple of years ago, and it's so encouraging to me. And this is when I try to focus on the little picture and the big picture. The measure of success in a Christian's life is faithfulness not fame, not the number of followers that you have, not even in the number of people who tell you that they've changed their mind, but faithfulness. And if you're being faithful, God is going to do and change exactly what he wants to through you. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I kind of remain encouraged. Mm -hmm. God's going to do what he wants. Even that me, I love the way you, you create that, that picture you create of this, you know, this big picture of God's eternity the middle picture of what's happening in the world. And especially you see it through media and social media and the little picture of like the one heart, one mind you can yeah. reach and you can love. 
But I will also say for that medium picture, I really believe there's so many intentional lies being told about that medium picture mm -hmm. that become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Mm -hmm. And you know this from social experiments where you see, you know, I don't know if you saw that famous clip of the guy, he's out there dancing and he gets other people to get out there dancing with him, but it started with the one guy doing it and then everyone didn't. It's like, oh, it's normal to dance like crazy in public. Yeah. And so if you think everybody else believes a certain way, mm. if you think everyone else behaves a certain way, then it's much easier to think you should behave and behave that way. And this was the strategy when it comes to sex. This was the strategy of the sexual revolutionaries with Alfred Kinsey. He would do these experiments on a prisoner population and he would do these surveys about their sexual behaviors. And then he would say, well, this many of them cheat, this many of them are swingers, this many of them uh, are polyamorous, this many of them are you know, bisexual or homosexual, this many of them are pedophilic. And he would say this population is representative. He would extrapolate that on the rest of the population. And then he published all these studies and books. And so he would tell your average person that X amount of you guys are cheating on your spouses, doing swinging culture, are homosexual, are bisexual, and create these categories of sexual behavior that he would normalize mm. to say, this is normal activity. And the problem with repeating a lie enough times is it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy for the people believing it. And yeah. so they think it is normal then to cheat on my spouse. It's normal if I have same-sex attraction to go act on it and to develop a whole identity around it et cetera, et cetera. And so when I look at the medium yep. picture, I'm actually hopeful because I see this intentional deception that's happening relentlessly on issues of abortion, sexuality, these different things where people are being told everyone is pro-abortion. Yeah. And everyone is for same-sex couples adopting. Everyone is for these things. But then when you actually talk to people about it and your everyday person who maybe is afraid to sometimes post it on social media, a lot more, nature is powerful. The law of God and the so natural true. law is powerful. It's written on the heart and people still show up and say, you know, actually, I, I don't agree with that. Yeah. I don't agree. And that law of God being written on our hearts is obvious even to say Planned Parenthood or the abortion lobby. If it weren't true mm -hmm. that human beings instinctively know basically the difference between right and wrong, Planned Parenthood would come out and say, see, this is how we do an abortion. Isn't it good? See, it's a great point. This is this mm -hmm. is how a baby develops in the womb. Don't you think it's fine to kill her? Let me tell you about mm -hmm. the chemical combination that we use to inject in the baby's heart in the second trimester abortion. It's the same chemical combination that's used in lethal mm -hmm. injections of murders on death row, by the way. They wouldn't use words like mm -hmm. bodily autonomy or terminating a pregnancy or contents of pregnancy or even fetus. They would just be outright about it. That would be their advertising mm. and PR campaign. When you've got a good product, you don't use euphemisms mm. and lies to try to say, well, we don't want to tell you what our product or service mm. actually is. Just trust us that it's mm. really good. They know it's bad. They know it's barbaric, or they at least know that most people know it's bad. So it, that's, you're right. The law of God is written on hearts, and that is why propaganda for bad ideas is necessary. It's such a good point. And I know you make it again and again in toxic empathy. And it's true on the sexuality issues too. Yeah. Because it is not okay today in most circles to talk about the harm of disordered sexual activity, whether it's STI, sexually transmitted infections, which like a century ago were almost nowhere. I mean, there were some if you went to brothels, but you don't, that wasn't like a thing. The, the amount of people who have STIs has skyrocketed in the last several decades. Obviously, unwanted pregnancy, out of wedlock pregnancy. People, you know, nine out of every 10 women's having abortions, they're unmarried. And then when it comes to some of this more exploratory, you know, sexual uh, deviant behavior, that's also rarely talked about the damage. Uh, there's a group of, I know people who used to live the same sex lifestyle, especially the gay homosexual lifestyle, talking about the physical harm that that lifestyle, that kind of sexual activity specifically has yeah. on their physical bodies mm -hmm. beyond even STIs. And then of course, there's a, the, the physical harm of transgender you know, reassignment surgeries. Uh, do you find when that is talked about, and again, very controversial to even say, oh, there's consequences to physical consequences yeah. to sexual activity outside of a one man, one woman, full of love marriage, yeah. that there's physical, emotional consequences to that. How do you find people respond to that message? Oh, I think even conservatives, as we were talking about earlier, have a hard time with that one. And of course, we see that in our Republican representatives, 
that after Obergefell, most Republicans were like, okay, well, that's just a lost battle. Let's just focus on this other stuff, immigration, economics, things like Mm -hmm. that, that both sides can kind of maybe come together on, or at Mm -hmm. least pro LGBTQ conservatives can still get on board Mm -hmm. with. And of course, I think part of that is the Trumpification of the Republican Party. So he's, Mm -hmm. you know, a New York, I, I don't know if I'd call him liberal in every sense of the word, of course, but Socially, definitely, definitely so. But when you don't have a grounding in these fundamental moral and biological truths, then really anything goes. Like, what is even the reason Mm. for anything, for the foundation of our country, if we don't believe what the Declaration of Independence says, that we were created by God with certain inalienable rights? And if you don't believe that, then sure, marriage can be anything. Morality can be anything. But if that's the case, if morality can be anything, if we don't have a God that gave us certain inalienable rights, whose authority is transcendent over the government, then what justification do we have for borders and for sovereignty and for national identity? Um, That's, I mean, the founders at least knew, even though they weren't wrestling with the same cultural issues and moral issues that we are today, they at least knew that the basis of our legitimacy has to be that we were created by a God whose moral order, whose natural law, whose definitions of right and wrong and rights themselves, that that has to be the basis for a free country. And I'm just afraid that this whole like Christless, secular, conservative movement that we have, even though we can partner in some areas, at the end of the day, that's going to wash away like everything else because it's not anchored. That is such a good point. And I know you talk about that on your show and I'm seeing this more and more. Um, You use the word Trumpification, which you're right. I mean, he is a social liberal effectively, but I think a lot of conservatives stick are sticking with him because he is, he, you know, he wants a border. He says he wants a border and some of these other things. You do address immigration in your book as well as another topic that you explore. I want to talk about the Trump thing for a minute. We're obviously in an election cycle. You have expressed your dismay over some of the left-leaning turns that the Republicans have taken. And not all Republicans. No. There are definitely some really solid pro-life, pro-family, pro-marriage Republicans still standing. Yeah. But unfortunately, and there's an occasional Democrat, by the way, but they're very quiet about it. And they're very, very rare. um, And their party hates them. But increasingly, I'm seeing this happen on the right. Yeah. And it's deeply concerning to me that the platform changed two months ago. Yeah. That was not what Trump was running on in the primary. Yeah. Trump was not running on the platform changes that he made two months ago. Yeah. So it was and a he bait. certainly wasn't in 2016. And he certainly wasn't in 2016. So it was a bait and switch for voters. And so everyone knows in the show, I've been very vocal about it. You've been vocal about it too, saying this is a problem. Don't do yeah. this, President. You know, former President Trump. This is wrong. Um, I think where you and I may be at a di- point of disagreement at this time is that you're actively telling people you still got to show up and vote for Trump. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying you've got to threaten not to vote for Trump right now. Like Mm. this is a serious inflection point where he is actively flip-flopping on these issues. And we can and we must push him towards what he, you know, before in many ways was not willing to break down, but now he's just, you know, breaking it up. Melania Trump also came out last week with her book and a video explaining why she supports abortion unrestricted. So again, yeah, toxic empathy, call it what you want, yeah. but infiltrating yes. a movement that for decades, yes, we didn't always have the best politicians, but their principle was clear and there was an opportunity to hold the politician to the principle. Now the principle, even in the party platform, is being destroyed. Yeah. Okay, here's what I say. I think this is going to be so helpful for people if we kind of go back and forth and see our varying perspectives because you know, they might see the debates mm-hmm. that we've done left versus mm-hmm. right on abortion or gender, but you don't often get like the nuances within mm-hmm. the conservative side on this. So I think this will be super helpful. Everylife.com is America's fastest growing baby diaper and wipes company. I love Every Life because this is a premium product made from the best materials for your little one. And everylife.com is a pro-life company. In fact, when you join the Changing Lives Club at everylife.com, you will get 10% off your order and you will also be able to donate one month's free supply to a mom or a baby in need so that they can get the diapers that they need. Did you know that some of the biggest diaper companies today like Huggies and Pampers are owned by conglomerates that are pro-abortion? 
That's why Every Life is so important. Not only is the product better, I know from personal experience, than the Huggies and Pampers products, but the Every Life diaper is also part of a mission to save lives. When you go to everylife.com slash join, you can join the Changing Lives Club. This way you can set up a subscription to get your diapers and your wipes, these premium products delivered right to your door for your little one. And after three months of the subscription, you will be able to donate for free a month's supply of diapers to a mom and a baby in need. So what are you waiting for? Go to everylife.com slash join. Join the Changing Lives Club. Use the code LILA at checkout. Get 10% off your order, start your subscription, and after three months, you can donate a full month supply of diapers to a mom and a baby in need. We both agree that Trump's position and Vance's position now on abortion just aren't pro-life. They're not what we wanted to be. A lot of people say, Mm -hmm. well, who cares about that? This is who Trump has always been. Mm -hmm. But as we pointed out in 2016, he said, look, I'm going to appoint pro-life justices. He cared about the evangelical vote. He cared about the pro-life vote. He promised something. We got that in exchange. And they helped helped him win. I don't think he would have won. It was because Trump got the evangelical and conservative vote in 2016 that he won. Yeah. And the reason he got the vote is because they said, we want these things from you and you need to deliver. And that hap- that whole yeah. transaction happened. People say, well, Trump's transactional. That transaction happened. There's no transaction right now. Right. Now it's just Trump steamrolling over his yes. voter block and saying, sorry, guys, I'm going to do this other thing. Okay. So that's, well, therein, lies the, therein lies the rub. Yes, yeah. therein lies the rub. There's a couple things mm-hmm. I would say on that. Number one, I do think that Trump can be pushed towards life. And I I know that you saw this when everyone, including Mm -hmm. you, and you kind of spearheaded this, raised a respectful ruckus about Mm -hmm. Trump basically saying, well, I think six weeks is too short. I don't know how I'm going to vote on Amendment Mm -hmm. 4. But he ended up coming out and saying, look, this is radical. I'm voting no on Amendment Mm -hmm. 4 in Florida. And so he was influenced by the outcry of people who said, no, that's too far. Kamala Harris would never be influenced that direction. Mm -hmm. She would never back down from being completely radical on abortion. Neither would Tim Walz. Their record proves this. This is not hyperbole. Your listeners already know Kamala Mm -hmm. Harris's record, so I don't even need to go into that. I think Trump, even if he is not as pro-life as we want him to be, it is a mistake to say, well, both parties are basically the same. They're not. There's a lot of daylight between the Republican position, which we would like to be a lot stronger, and the Democrat position, which is no limit through all nine months paid for by the taxpayer. And even after nine months, if the baby survives an abortion, they should be left to die. That's the Democrat Mm -hmm. position. The Republican position is not that. Even if Mm -hmm. it is not as strong as we want, It's not that. So I'll pause there. That's the on the abortion. But then I've got some other reasons why I'm voting for Trump. But go ahead. Yes. Well, on on abortion, if we hold that for a moment, because I want to explore that a little more. I see, you know, I I look I'm I'm looking 10 years out. Right. So Mm -hmm. this election is about tomorrow. It is about the day after we vote. But this and it's about 2025. But this election is also about. a a crucial juncture in the story that's playing out over the next decades, Mm. the next few decades. Mm -hmm. So I think there's sort of an immediacy with an election where you think, okay, I just got to get, like, I just got to hang on for another year, you know, kind of thing. Like, you know, then people say, well, if Trump doesn't win, it's going to be the death knell, you know, death knell for the entire Republic. I mean, there's that. And by the way, the left says that about the right. So they're both saying that about each other. But this is the concern, right? The concern is if voters go out and there's different degrees, because you can go out and say, Trump's the most pro president ever, wear the MAGA hat, I'm so excited to vote for him, right? That camp. And then there's the camp that says, I'm going to hold my nose and vote for him because he's better than Kamala, right? Mm-hmm. So there, that is an important distinction. And I want to just address the people that like want to be excited to vote for him, which I totally can understand because we're dealing with a Democrat party that is so left, you know, militantly pro-abortion. And so you want to have a champion to stand up to that, right? But I think one mistake we can make is if we make it seem like if we don't speak truth to power and we make it seem like we we basically gloss over the problems with our own candidate because we want them to win so badly. And this is just in conversation with friends, on podcasting, wherever it is, we pretend like those problems don't exist or we kind of rationalize them instead of acknowledging, yes, these problems exist. And I'll still in this situation vote for the lesser of two evils. So yeah. there is that. And I, I love what you do on this, Allie, because I do think you don't whitewash, you don't gloss over and you call a spade a spade. That unfortunately is not what 
I think everyone in the kind of media circuit is doing right now because yeah. again, they, they're so afraid of Trump losing that they're willing to yeah. gloss over yes. some of these problems. They'll speak about them privately, but they won't dare speak about them publicly. And I think the mistake that that makes is it further enshrines that these things don't matter. Yeah. Because if you're going to go hard for this candidate who is betraying you on these issues and you're not willing to call that out while still saying, I'm going to still vote because they're better than the other, then I think you cement the idea that those things don't matter that much. Yeah. In the very same people that you're talking to. What what is your take on that? Yeah. I agree with you mm -hmm. that you lose trust with your audience and you should if you pretend that the issues with Trump or your disagreements with Trump just don't exist or you minimize them. And I mean, obviously you've seen this, but those of us mm -hmm. who do criticize Trump or Melania when they say something pro-choice we're blamed. We're like, how, why are you talking about this? We're a month out from the election. You're going to make him lose. I'm like, no, get mad at the politicians who are saying this a month mm -hmm. out from the election. There is no good reason why Melania Trump should have come out 50 days before the election and said, yeah, I believe that a right to terminate your pregnancy is fundamental to a woman's bodily autonomy. Like that is absolutely insane. Mm -hmm. Don't get mad at us for saying that that's insane. Mm -hmm. Get mad at her for saying something that is insane. Um, so anyway, I, I think that I agree with you on that. I agree with you that we should be calling out Trump and criticizing when it's justified. The reason why I am still voting for Donald Trump, you mentioned that both sides are like, oh, well, this is an end to our country. Well, just because both sides are saying it doesn't mean they're both wrong. I think that one side is right and one side is wrong. We have Donald Trump's record that he has not pushed us towards an autocracy. He hasn't pushed us towards a theocracy. Uh, like the guy who was basically a playboy is not going to bring in The Handmaid's Tale. That's like the most ridiculous thing. He used to judge bikini contests. Like he's not going to be the one forcing women to wear red robes and to be sex slaves to men. It's crazy. Um, and so... That, I think, criticism of Donald mm -hmm. Trump, that he's going to be the end to democracy, is just not founded in reality. It's not founded in his record. And when you look at Kamala Harris, like she is the chaos candidate. Her and Tim Walls are as far left as you can be. That's not mm -hmm. hyperbole. Actually, when you look at her record as senator, she was the furthest left senator when she served in the Senate, even alongside Bernie Sanders, who was her colleague at the time. I don't have to tell your audience what she did in the state of California, both as attorney general and as district attorney of San Francisco, not only to go after pro-lifers, whether it's pregnancy center telling them that they have to prominently advertise for abortion. That fact act was overturned, of course, by the Supreme Court because it's a violation of the First Amendment. Also going after your friend David Delighton for reporting on Planned Parenthood, another violation of the First Amendment. And so we see that she doesn't care about your most fundamental constitutional rights if they get in the way of abortion. We know the Biden-Harris administration, they've jailed pro-lifers for peaceful demonstrations in front of abortion clinics. 11 in federal prison right now. Yes, including mm -hmm. Joan Bell, who is 74, mm -hmm. I think. And so, so just got a life award this weekend. She's in jail, yes. couldn't receive it in person, but she's in jail for her pro -life, peaceful pro-life work. Yes. So these sentinels of democracy, we're told on the left, will violate every single one of your constitutional rights if it gets in the way of abortion. And if we look at the Equality Act, which of course hasn't passed, the same thing with LGBTQ. They will absolutely violate your First Amendment rights and force you mm -hmm. to celebrate, to marry, to affirm verbally mm -hmm. the sexual and gender choices of people that you don't align with, who have choices and identities that you don't affirm. Um, and so that's Kamala Harris. and. When I look at what is actually a threat to freedom, what's actually a threat to order, I'm looking at a candidate that believes in institutionalizing sexual degeneracy and disorder. She's been the border czar for the last three and a half years. Our border crossings are worse than they've been. Of course, the amount of sex and drug trafficking, the human toll at the border because of lawlessness and borderlessness is so great. I actually am afraid that our country would not survive a presidency under Kamala Harris. I don't mean that we would actually be dissolved in the next four years, but the damage that she would cause in the next four to eight years would be so great to our nation's sovereignty, security, stability, even globally. 
whereas Trump really brought in peace through his um, diplomacy, that really scares me. And so while I don't want to make a short-sighted decision with Donald Trump, I don't want them to think, well, look, we can just sell out pro-lifers and they'll still vote for us. I And pro-familiers. I, it's, I it's, it it is look, the marriage thing too. It's not just this abortion. This is a binary choice yeah. though. It is a binary choice. And I don't, if someone doesn't vote for either candidate, it's not like I think they've lost their salvation or something. But we are looking at an election that has a lot at stake. And I try really hard not to exaggerate because that's another thing I think can lose, can like make you lose trust with your audience. I don't want to put hyperboles out there. I don't want to fear monger. But when I just look at who she is, the record of what she's done, the bloodthirst that I think marks her record as a politician, mm -hmm. not even to mention the very tawdry and scary stuff in her and her husband's personal life with abuse and sexual degeneracy and selling her body mm -hmm. for power. Like, I think that it's a very, very scary prospect to have Kamala Harris in the White House. And yes, I am going to vote against mm -hmm. that. Even if I don't love what Donald Trump has said, I'm going to vote against that. I'm going to vote for the more orderly candidate because disorder and chaos, they're products of Satan. He is the king of chaos, mm -hmm. and God is a God of order. We see that from the beginning. He placed mm -hmm. us in a garden with boundaries, not a jungle. And everywhere we see walls and borders and parameters depicted in the Bible, it's positive, either metaphorically or literally. And I think that we can take that into account, not only when we're talking about the literal borders of our country, but also the borders and parameters of morality and family. There's a scary quote that I heard recently that the cost for abortion, the consequence of abortion, over 60 million little boys and girls murdered by abortion since 1973 in America alone. Globally, we're talking maybe 2 billion plus. It's insane that the cost for abortion may be nuclear, will be, is the quote, nuclear war. Mm. And I mentioned this on a show recently. It was improperly ascribed to Mother Teresa, meaning the bloodthirst and the bloodletting of abortion on a spiritual level, the judgment. Mm. And and also, it's not just like some something, it's not something God does, because God doesn't kill, God doesn't do nuclear war. That's not something God does. But it's a natural consequence in the chaos to what you're speaking to, connecting it back to what you just said, it's the chaos that we've created culturally where, you know, left is right, up is down, a baby's not a baby, it's okay to kill a baby. That same morally confused, chaotic culture is a culture that weakens itself to be at the point of, you can use the word invasion, but the point of bad decision making when it comes to foreign affairs, when it comes to everything else we do as a society, mm -hmm. a society that is willing to sell the right to life of the child is a society that is willing to and it, and will make mistakes on many other things. So that's the that's the idea there. Yeah. And I think there's a lot to that idea. And so going back to this election, like this historic election, and going back to this incredibly difficult, uh, chaotic moment that we find ourselves in. So many people are so concerned as they should be about our country and our future and what to do in this election. I agree. Voting for Kamala is, uh, you know, on abortion, she's worse. Then Trump Vance, she wants to enshrine Roe v. Wade. Now the actual implication of that versus President Trump literally saying that he doesn't support pro-life laws, that he thinks California has the right to have an abort, you know, right to abortion and yeah. do what they want. Practically, they look really pretty similar, which is horrible to say, but that is do that they? Is, so to say you, this is my yeah, question, yeah. and I don't want mean to like turn the tables, no, but I'm, do. I'm really uh, curious. So turn them, Allie. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, okay. Then I'll finish what the other so thought. So Trump let's believes, go here. which yeah. obviously we agree with, yeah. or we disagree with, yep. that oh well, it's just a state issue. Basically, yep. stop bothering me about it. That's how I think that he. But, wants, well, that's not but, what he says though, because he says it's a state's issue, but then he says, and you should have. He's prescriptive about it. Mm. It's not. It's if, it's not just the message of let the states decide, which, by the way, is a horrible message. I agree. Like with California you. have abortion through nine months. Right. Not my not my problem. I'm gonna wash my hands of this, even though there's right. a constitutional right to life. It's also Florida doesn't have enough weeks. Mm. I we need these exceptions. Yeah. Um, in personal conversations, I have been able to have um, with the campaign. It's it's a personal belief of this is not there is not an. Uh, uh, a, a clear right to life, but that there is a right in many 
in many situations to abortion. And so it would be one thing if it was a pure washing of the hands, and even that would be a hugely problematic, but it's more than that. There's a positive right to abortion that, mm. that exists there. Yeah. He just- In that world. Right. He believes in some kind of exception. And I just wonder well, how Well, an abortion much... in the first trimester, basically. Yeah. 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 And he said that on multiple occasions. Yeah. So, but what he would do politically is he would leave it up to the states. And the reason I say stop bothering mm -hmm. me about it is because, I mean, he can't actually go to Georgia or go to Texas and say, hey, you need more weeks on the books right now. Politically, I think he mm -hmm. wishes it were an issue and that he would just not talk about it anymore and that he gave it to the states, he mm -hmm. did what he needs to do, and now it's done. Whereas Kamala Harris they want to mm -hmm. federalize whatever they say Roe v. Wade, yeah. but it would probably look a lot like the laws that states have on the books that say, yeah, you have basically an unmitigated right, right. through 24 weeks. And then after that, as mm -hmm. long as the health care provider says that you right. need it, it could be for mental or emotional mm -hmm. health or family or financial mm -hmm. situation, then you also have a right. So basically abortion through all nine months and no state would be able to have a law that goes against that federal if law, they, correct? If they got that through the House, and the, which is, by the way, anybody who might be thinking, again, you know, it's their conscience. They obviously can't vote for Kamala. They're struggling. Can I vote for Trump? I do think it's essential that we, you know, regardless of who's in power, um, but especially if Kamala is in power, I think we need to ensure that that doesn't happen, what you're describing, that there's not, you know, yeah. Roe v. Wade enshrined federally for the next four years. And but so, that would be different than Trump not, which I think he should sign a law mm -hmm. that would restrict, that would ban right. abortion. But we got to keep the House and the Senate is what I'm saying. He, or we need to keep enough of a, a barrier the same, in the Senate. If everything stayed the same, Florida would get to keep their heartbeat law. Mm -hmm. Texas would be able to do the same. Georgia would be able to do the same. But if Kamala Harris got her way, none of these states would be able to have the restrictions that they have, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not the same. Trump well, and, not and signing that's if she versus, has. It, that's if the Democrats have full power yeah. of the House and the Senate. I, I think the other piece here, though, that it, that and what I was kind of saying earlier that I'm wrestling with, and I want to hear what you think about this. When it comes to what Trump, the Trumpification comment you made earlier, when it comes to what President Trump has done, even with J.D. Vance, he's actually a great case study mm -hmm. and we're watching it happen in real time, right? J.D. Vance had this 100% pro-life rating from Susan B. Anthony List, mm -hmm. right? Because he went out there, he was like, you know, no, there's no exception. You can't kill a baby just because they're conceived in violence. It's not good for women anyways. Um, you know, abortion is wrong. It's always wrong. There's a constitutional right to life. You know, he was on it, right? And then because of the influence of President Trump, he has been, I mean, I don't think anyone's forced to say anything. I think he could have said politely, I will not say what's untrue. I will not lie. I will not yeah. do this. It's wrong. I think that would have been the heroic thing to do. Unfortunately, J.D. Vance has chosen to go the path of, I'm going to just identify exactly with Trump's public policy on this, and I'm going to sacrifice my beliefs here. And it's not just a belief, like a religious belief, it's what's right, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, when it comes to human life is worthy of protecting. So, you know, what does it look like? What do you think? Like, let's say Trump wins. Let's like game theory it. Let's say Trump wins because the, he gets, you know, everyone's so horrified by Kamala Harris, right? They all, we all get out to vote for President Trump. He wins. He wins in a landslide. He has the evangelical vote locked down, the Catholic vote, enough of it locked down, conservatives. What does that do long-term to the Republican party? and to the political opportunities of the pro-life, pro-family voting bloc. Because now not only have we completely turned out the vote, right? We have also, I think, sent a message to people like J.D. Vance that it's totally fine. Like you did, he did a full 180. Like yeah. Trump, you know, has always had a, had a few exceptions in his platform on this, right? But J.D. Vance did a full 180 and Trump wants the polit political party, the Republicans, to have these also ultimately socially left flanks. Mm -hmm. So how do you see the future of the party? In today's modern world, it can be very difficult to take the time and the space to pray and even to know how to pray. That's why I love the Hallo app. The Hallow app is the number one Christian app in the world. It's been downloaded over 15 million times and it helps us deepen our relationship with God. When you use the Hallow app, you get access to over 10,000 guided prayers, meditations, stories, and other content to help you with your prayer. Whether you're driving in your car or you're doing dishes or you're just going about your day and you just need five to 10 minutes to sit down and focus on what matters most, your relationship with God, Hello App will help you do that. 
With Hallow, you'll learn to pray with scripture using the Bible. You'll also discover prayers that have been prayed by Christians for thousands of years. I also love that Hallow takes some of the most beautiful and the best spiritual classics and incorporates them for you into your daily prayer life. Right now, there's a special challenge going on with Hallow to rediscover the Christian classic by C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity. Mere Christianity was one of the key books for me that helped me in my journey and my walk with Jesus Christ. And what Hallow is doing is taking excerpts from Mere Christianity and doing guided prayer times after reading through the excerpts. There's all kinds of fun challenges on the Hallow app to help you improve your prayer life and again, access to every kind of prayer that you can imagine. I especially love the kids' content on Hallow. I use it with my kids, and they also have wonderful sleep prayers and sleep stories that you can use to help you wind down at the end of a long day. You can download Hallow for free for three months when you go to the link in the description or go to hallow.com slash Lila. That's hallow.com slash Lila. Download Hallow today and deepen your prayer walk with God. Well, I think no matter who wins, we have to start working right now on who's going to be our primary candidate in 2028 or who's going to, who we want to be the nominee in 2028 because Trump, I mean, it's not going to be Trump. Obviously he'll finish out. We want someone that's going to be Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm. And so right now we have to start selecting Mm -hmm. that person, working on supporting that person, deciding who we want to win. And we have to start rallying people behind that cause Mm -hmm. now And that is true if Kamala Harris wins as well, because I'm not so sure that if Trump loses, Mm -hmm. that people will wake up and say, oh, wow, I really see that he should have he should have tried to get Mm -hmm. more pro-life support. And so we're going to get a different person in. Oh, I I don't think that's the lesson that's going to be drawn. And then we've just lost four years of the country. Not by the pro-choice Republicans anyways. I think it's more it's more a question of you know, what, who is, who is, who is running the show, so to speak, and not running, running the show, but what is the, what is the influence, mm-hmm. right, of social conservatives? And, you know, we could just kind of, you know, put the, run the battle down the field and say, listen, we got to vote for the lesser of two evils, and then we'll just try to pick someone better next time, you know, that is, is going to be strong on these issues. The, the big question mark there is when you have an incumbent, when you have someone who just won their election and they're the kingmaker in the Republican Party, it's easier for them to pick the successor, right? Mm-hmm. It's easier for the party to go that route because they're in power. When and if there's a loss, right, because of maybe mistakes the candidate might have made, then it's easier to disrupt the party. And we saw this even with what just happened with Biden and Harris, right? Biden was not performing well, you know maybe cognitive decline. I mean, I think a lot of people think, yeah, he's getting he's getting older, he's having struggle, he's having troubles. So they basically appointed Kamala. You know, he steps down, they appoint Kamala. Unfortunately, now she looks like she's gonna be, you know, the next kingmaker for the party if she wins, especially. Uh, but do you see what do you see what I'm saying yeah. here? It's like who is going to set the tone? Yeah. And if Trump does win, there's a tone setting that has happened on the Republican side that will influence 2028. I would like to believe, like you and I, we will have this influence and all of our friends, our influence in 2028 if Trump wins and who's going to be the nominee. But I think the biggest and most influential voice will be Trump in 2028 if he wins in 2024. And you think that if he doesn't win, there's more of a chance for those of us who are truly pro-life to influence. And I'm just not sure about mm. that because i think the the time for this conversation mm. was during the primary and i know you said mm. earlier that trump really kind of did a bait and switch but mm. he was during mm. the primary when we still mm. had DeSantis as an option mm. out there saying well you know florida's mm. florida's six week ban i think that was way too soon that was ridiculous maybe he was just trying to hit DeSantis mm. on that because he saw him as a competitor But I think a lot of us would have preferred a more pro-life candidate i know i would have i would have preferred ron DeSantis. Mm. I don't know, for a variety of reasons, he didn't gain the support. And so like we had that opportunity, we had that option then. And if that were really where the Republican party were, enough of us would have been able to band together and say, no, we're not voting for the guy that just criticized the heartbeat bill in Florida, but we didn't. Mm -hmm. And so now here we are. So now we've got the only thing standing between Kamala Harris and the White House. I still think Kamala Harris's four to eight years in the White House is too destructive to justify not voting for Trump, mm-hmm. even, even with what you're talking about. Because I understand, I really do understand that calculation. And I don't want to become the cheap date of the Republican mm-hmm. Party, you know, that just says, okay, well, 
basically, in kind of crude terms, we know that the Christian mm-hmm. pro-lifers are going to put out no matter what, and there's not that much that we have to do. Maybe buy them dinner, maybe not, and mm-hmm. that's it. Um, I don't want that, and I understand the threat there, but at the same time, the specter of another four years of a Harris Mm -hmm. administration, I just don't know if the damage is Mm -hmm. worth it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And that's not to say that everything that you're saying isn't true, but I don't know that Trump losing is going to give us this ability to revitalize and pro-lifeify the Republican Party enough. I mean, I I agree with that last comment too, because I'm not saying that if Trump loses, all of a sudden pro-life somehow won. Mm. That's not the case. Mm. Uh, You know, tragically, none of it's the case because then we have Kamala Harris in the White House. And then you still have to do the hard work of detangling the Republican Party's future and figuring out how do we have, you know, how does the Republican Party have a future that's a pro-life future? And you're going to have a lot of consultants blaming the pro-life vote for Trump's loss if he loses. Yeah, That's going to happen. Trump already did that in the midterms. Yeah, Trump blamed pro-lifers specifically for the losses of candidates like Herschel Walker. Yeah. And, you know, Herschel Walker, who's not pro-life, by the way, but somehow his loss gets blamed. The pro-lifers get blamed for his loss. He's just a terrible candidate or Dr. Oz, who wasn't, again, even pro-life. And somehow his loss gets blamed on pro-life voters, you know? So I think- It's never the politicians. It's always like the scapegoat. I think the pro-life voters are going to get blamed either way, whether it's their fault. And I don't think it would be their fault either way. But I think just back to that longevity question of what are we aiming towards as a movement and how are we going to get there? I, I We need a game plan, you know, that is beyond this election because the, the, the as you said, the Trumpification of the party is is undoing yeah. the principles. It's undoing the foundations that we hold so dear and we know are necessary for the future of the country. Yeah. It's not just a partisan thing. Yeah. So I think it's unfortunate that the alternative to Trump is pro-lifers being put in jail Mm -hmm. and our First Amendment rights being systematically violated by someone whose entire career has Mm -hmm. been buoyed by the blood money of Planned Parenthood. And that's Kamala Mm -hmm. Harris. And so also when I'm thinking about the longevity of the pro-life movement, I'm also Mm -hmm. thinking, okay, like how many pro-lifers are going to be? And I hate to sound exaggeratory, but again, David Delighton is a case study in this. Like is Mm -hmm. pro-life and investigative work, is it going to be legal? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be allowed? Like what is big tech going to look Mm -hmm. like when Democrats finally get their way and they're able to use whatever crisis is at hand to justify a an even worse wave of censorship Mm -hmm. than we saw uh, during COVID, during 2020. So I'm also thinking Mm -hmm. about the survival of the constitutional rights that are necessary for pro-lifers to freely do our work without fear of consequence. And uh, I I wish that were just like, you know, pie in the sky, not pie in the sky, but just like some kind of conspiracy theory. But again, looking Mm -hmm. at her record, I'm not sure that that's an exaggerated fear. Is it different for you because it's Kamala versus Biden? Or in your view, was Biden just completely controlled by the far left anyways? Well, I think I think As a Biden candidate. is. Yeah. I think that he probably personally is less radical mm-hmm. than Kamala Harris. But I don't think that matters because we've certainly seen over the past mm-hmm. few weeks that he's not running the country. No yeah. one even talks about our president of the United States anymore. Mm-hmm. The people who are running the country are probably the people who have always been running the yeah. country. And none of us know exactly who that is but they're certainly far left and that's pretty scary. Um, It's tough. Yeah. I mean, I think this is the toughest election in my lifetime. Are you feeling that? I think so. Uh, Yes. For some reason, I feel that it's a little less vitriolic than 2016 and 2020. Mm -hmm. I don't know why, but 2016 was a doozy. Mm -hmm. I felt like that was when a lot of people lost friendships, relationships, got very polarized. 2020 didn't help. I mean, certainly I've seen people go liberal that I'm like, really? You too? But it doesn't seem quite as needed. There's more permission now people have to vote for one or the other. It's not as controversial to be yeah, pro Trump anymore. I think people anymore. are over the embarrassment of voting yes. for Trump. Yes. I Certainly think that's after true. he was almost assassinated twice, yeah. I think people are like, mm-hmm. you know what? Whatever. Yeah, mm-hmm. I support him. Yeah. I support him. Um, And so, yeah, I think that there's part of that, too. We've lost the, like, shock that Trump Mm. once brought into the picture. I'm not saying that's good or bad, but more people are just open about, yeah, I 
you know, I'm going to vote for him and Kamala is terrible, which I think is a good thing that more people are outspoken mm-hmm. about being against Kamala Harris. And I, people have asked me, like, who are you voting for? What sh- who should I vote for? And I've said, I, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. Mm. But I will tell you what I know about these the candidates' positions and my concerns about the long-term impact of those positions, which I know you're doing faithfully day in and day out. And at the end of the day, we do have to vote our conscience. I mean, that is what yeah. people have to do. So I, I think what you've done, Ali, in the space of not just the conservative movement, but you're talking to a lot more people even in the middle. I mean, I love that you're changing hearts and minds with your show and with Toxic Empathy is give language mm. for people with this to understand these attacks really coming from you know the far left pro-aborts, all of these ideologies, to be able to talk about them in a way that is winsome because people are getting so increasingly confused with all of the ideologies just pounding us constantly. Um, Did you have a favorite topic to dismantle in, Mm. uh, lie to dismantle, toxic toxic empathy to dismantle in your book? Yeah. You know, they're all subjects that I talk about a lot. I I was surprised at how passionate I was while I was typing Mm. out my immigration chapter, Mm. because that's not really a subject that I focus on quite as much. Of course, it's something that I care about. I was born and raised in Texas. And so the border issue is something that affects us a lot. Um, But I I haven't really gotten into the nitty gritty and the weeds of immigration policy on my show. And as I was typing it out, I just realized how absurd it is that we are being sold out. American citizens are being sold out out for people that are not only not citizens, but in many cases, not all, but in many cases really have no love of this country, have no fidelity to American values whatsoever. And not only are we being sold out, but a lot of these people are given preferential treatment, they're being subsidized. And so the American citizen can't even compete in employment and housing for some of those who are literally being imported and bussed mm. and flown into the interior of the United States to purposely change the demographics of America to change its political trajectory. And they say that that's some kind of crazy conspiracy theory, but they're very open about it as well. And I'm, when I say they, I mean mm. left-wing media. Um, yeah, and we started that chapter telling the heartstring pulling story of a woman named Maribel Diaz who fled Mexico because of poverty, because of violence with her children and with her sickly husband. And uh, when Donald Trump became president, she was deported and she was separated from her children. It was a gut-wrenching story for me to read and to write about because she had small children and she was separated from them. And that is my biggest fear, being separated from my kids. And so I do feel empathy for her. Like I can place myself in her shoes and think, oh my gosh, this would be so terrible. This would be so scary. She moved to Fairfield, Ohio. She created a life there. It's the only home her kids knew. And yet she was deported. She was sent back home to Mexico. And that is the only side of the story that most people hear. And so because they have empathy for that mother, they think, okay, I've got it. Even though they might not say I'm for open borders, they think I'm against deportation. I am for these people coming here and having a better life. But then I looked at the other side. Who, what's the human cost on the other side of the illegal immigration issue? And I told the equally gut-wrenching story, the actually much worse gut-wrenching story of Kate Steinle, mm-hmm. who was walking on a pier in San Francisco with her dad enjoying an afternoon mm-hmm. walk. And she was shot in the back and her last words before she took her last breath in her father's arms were, help me daddy. Mm-hmm. And she was shot by an illegal immigrant who had been deported five times and yet had been shielded by San Francisco's uh, sanctuary city policies, which were, of course, championed by Kamala Harris. Mm -hmm. And he was supposed to be deported again. But of course, San Francisco Mm -hmm. wouldn't cooperate with ICE. That's what a sanctuary city is. And so he was protected. He stole a gun from a truck. He shot her in the back and she died. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing. It's the same kind of story with Molly Tibbetts, with Lake and Riley, all innocent young women who were living their lives until they were violently murdered by illegal aliens. And so for every Maribel Diaz, you have five or more of these men who come into the country illegally because they are incentivized to do so and unfortunately take the lives of young people, whether it's drunk driving or whether it's this kind of violence or whether it's the story that we just saw out of Nantucket where these Venezuelan migrants or sorry, Honduran migrants were arrested for raping children. 
in the city. And the difference between the crime that's committed by the illegal alien and the crime that's committed by the citizen, because both commit crimes, is that every single crime that is committed by an illegal alien is preventable. It's preventable. You can't prevent every single crime that's committed by a citizen, but you can prevent every single crime that's committed by someone who should never be here in the first place. And so I, as I was just telling these stories of these innocent citizens, innocent people who lost their lives because of the dereliction of duty of our government, whose first responsibility is to take care of its own people first. It just, it made me Mm. sad. It made me angry. And borders and governments and countries were God's idea. They were placed for our good parameters, boundaries. Those were all God's idea. God is a God of order It is borderlessness is lawlessness and lawlessness always has a high human cost, not only for the countries that these people are leaving, but also for our own countries. I don't think America has the moral obligation. I don't think any country has the moral obligation actually to accept anyone. I think we should and we can accept a certain number of asylum seekers and refugees. But this idea that we have to allow anyone in who wants to come here in order to be moral and compassionate No one makes that argument for Zimbabwe. No one makes that argument for Indonesia. But when America wants to regulate our immigration, all of a sudden it's white supremacist and cruel. And I just don't buy that. I think every country should put their citizens first. I think most of the people that I talk to, even on the left and on the right, they agree that there is a thing called national sovereignty, that governments have a not just a right, but a responsibility to have a border and that how borders work, obviously there's a lot of prudential decision-making about how the border works, how you manage the flow of immigration, but that that is the right of a government and the, the responsibility of a government to do, to manage immigration, to have less or more of it, depending on the needs of the country, and to have a, some often a vetting process to ensure that the people entering are going to be good, yeah. you know, good members of the country and, and part of the, the human society that's formed. I am curious about those two stories or the, the stories that you tell, because when you talk about the young mother who's deported, and especially if she's not a, not an offender, she's not a criminal offender beyond coming here as an undocumented or an illegal alien. And then you have the story of someone who is literally murdering, raping, and often they have criminal histories. Mm-hmm. You know, usually these are repeat offenders that are not deported the first time. Many of the stories you referenced, they were not deported the first time at, upon criminal offense. Mm-hmm. They stayed in the country and they, they you know, it was a repeat offense situation. And then the, the offenses get worse. And then maybe it, you know, becomes this big story. And then it's like, how could they have not have been deported? They were here um, illegally anyways. Is there a difference in your view between deporting a mother of young children who flees to this country and is here undocumented and deporting a violent offender? Well, of course, I want all violent offenders to be prioritized in the deportation process. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But for that young mother, I want her to come legally. I want her to try to come legally. And again, I think a country also has a right to say, this is how many legal immigrants we are going to admit. Mm -hmm. And here's our vetting process. So I'm not saying unmitigated legal immigration either, but there is a legal process to become a refugee, to gain asylum. Some people think that every person that shows up at the border is seeking asylum. Well, just because you come from a country that is poorer than the United States, which is every country in the world, doesn't mean that you're seeking asylum or that you qualify as a refugee. You don't have a right to come here illegally just because Mm -hmm. you want a better life. There aren't any other countries that I know of that allow for that kind of thing, at least when it comes to illegal immigration. Um, And so, yes, there is a difference between those two people and the threat that they pose. But when it comes down to the principle of, as you said, having borders, Mm -hmm. you don't have borders if they're not enforced. Everyone can say, look at that map. That's where America Mm -hmm. exists. But if you don't Mm -hmm. enforce your borders with some kind of consequence, some kind of consequence, whatever that Mm -hmm. is, then it doesn't matter. They are just lines on a map and anyone can step over a line on a map. And so we have to have enforced borders. We have to have, I think, stringent laws. We have to disincentivize as much as possible Mm -hmm. the trafficking that goes on the costly and dangerous journey across the border that people are taking that are, you know, losing lives. And the sad thing is like one of our favorite families, our family friends, they are immigrants from Africa. They are so hardworking, godly. Their sons are beautiful, responsible, great young men. And we just love this family so much. We wish that there were millions more of them just because of what they contribute to every community they're a part of. 
And they have family members back home in Africa who would love to immigrate here, who would love to just get a visa to be able to come here. They're exactly like them. They're hardworking Christians. They would come here. They'd be industrious. And they keep getting denied. They keep getting denied a visa. And it's so difficult because all they want to do is come here and work and they want to do it the right way. They could probably, you know, come across the border illegally. It's not that hard to do right now. And they're getting denied a visa because the quota is already met for that country. Usually. You know why? Usually that's usually Do you think that's the we case. should increase quotas as we're strengthening the border to ensure that undocumented... Not until we strengthen the border and not until we conduct mass deportation. But do you think in the ideal world, would you say we strengthen the border and then we increase quotas for those that like this family you're describing yeah, i would be because open our population's to it. declining alley i mean this is the thing we talk about on the show if it if not for immigration we would not be replacing ourselves as a population well i right would now. rather address the anti-natalism push which that, i know that you needs would to be too. done <laughs> i would much rather yeah. address that than say okay let's just mm. allow because we're not just an economic like experiment like mm. america is a people with a mm -hmm. shared culture. Mm -hmm. And even though we come from different backgrounds, we have a shared values. We're mm -hmm. not just, it's not just about the numbers mm -hmm. of our population decline or increase. Mm -hmm. It is about who we are in our national identity. And again, when we start talking about culture and identity, for some reason it's wrong when America talks about it, but okay when Mexico talks mm -hmm. about it or another country. And so it's not just about that, but yes, like I am very open to that. If we got our illegal immigration under control, I want our immigration to be very strategic, that we are accepting people that are going to be a net positive or most likely to be a net positive to our society. But the absolute injustice is that we are allowing and then rewarding those mm -hmm who could have done it legally, but chose not to, because it's typically the Christians and the other countries who are saying, I'm not going to cross illegally because that's wrong. That's immoral because that's against God's law. And it's also law. very dangerous. Yes. So there's a, a protective so element there. That's the issue is that mm -hmm. we've got the Christians who know that they don't want to disobey God by breaking a law that are staying put and getting denied visas in many mm -hmm. cases. And then we've got people who are flouting the law coming through and that's going to be a big, you know, that's a moral shift in our country too. You talk about this in your book and it's of course a mandate to Christians to welcome the stranger. And Jesus actually, you know, talks about this. Our Lord talks about this and talks about how you were, I was a stranger and you welcomed me. Mm. There's this very, you know, throughout all of scripture, there is a repeated emphasis on the alien, the stranger, the foreigner yes. who is seeking refuge or a yes. better life. And even in the parable of the Good Samaritan, as an example, it is the other, it is the stranger that is held up as the example of doing the right thing because they chose to care for the person that they had no mm -hmm. ethnic or national tie to. This was somebody that was just, you know, up, an enemy really in yeah. society for them that they went and they took care of seeing them on the side of the road beaten and you know yeah. robbed and take them into an inn and spend money on them so there is this very distinct and this is what some christians who identify more as left would say right now they'd say mm -hmm. listen i hear what you're saying ali you know but we are supposed to welcome the stranger and yeah sometimes that's uncomfortable sometimes that's messy sometimes that involves um a lot of complications and even what might seem like even a, a negative for the population, because you said they have to be a net positive. What's your take on that? Oh, yeah. I would love to talk to someone who says that because typically those people are also so scared of theocracy and Christian nationalism that if you or I cited, say, Psalm 139 for my reason for to be against abortion, they would say, well, you should compartmentalize mm -hmm. your faith. You leave your faith over there. It shouldn't influence what you think mm -hmm. about policy. That's scary Christian nationalism, but they are the first ones to cite the Old yeah. Testament or cite what Jesus said to say, well, this is our prescription yeah. for immigration policy. So my first question should be, okay, what role does the Bible have in playing, mm -hmm. uh, does the Bible have in dictating our yeah. laws? Because sometimes you think yeah. that <laughs> it's justified and sometimes mm -hmm. you don't. And the fact of the matter mm -hmm. is, I think in both cases, we should always look at it in context. I don't mm -hmm. believe you can compartmentalize your faith mm -hmm. from what you believe. So I think it would be fine to say, here's what the Bible says about immigration. That's what drives what I believe about mm -hmm. it. The problem is, is that there's is a misapplication of scripture mm -hmm. because when we read to love the sojourner, because you all were once sojourners, mm -hmm. when God is talking to ancient Israel, ancient Israel, if you want to, if you want to look at immigration policy in ancient Israel and then apply it to America, mm -hmm. I might actually be open to something like what that, was that, which is extremely strict. Mm -hmm. Yes. If a sojourner for a foreigner 
was seeking refuge or seeking help and even material resources from Israel, there was a process for that. There were resources that were left for them. There was a portion of even the crops that were harvested that were left for them, but they were expected to follow every law. They were expected to assimilate. There was no place for their idolatry. There was no place for their lawlessness. And so they had very strict immigration laws. And of course, we see throughout Mm -hmm. scripture that every time a wall is depicted, it is a depiction literally or metaphorically Mm -hmm. of security, of God's Mm -hmm. love for his people, his protection of his people. The Garden of Eden had clear parameters. Heaven itself has Mm -hmm. walls. And so we actually see that the lack of walls is Mm -hmm. chaotic. And so, yes, you can love the sojourner. Maybe there is a process by which we accept certain foreigners. But if you are to use that as the justification for your immigration policy, then logically you're saying we should accept everyone. I always ask, well, what should the limit be? If you think loving the sojourner means that we should accept everyone who wants to come, are we obligated to accept everyone? every single person from every single country, no matter what their background is, no matter what they've done. And I think most people would say, no, there should be limits. Okay. If there are limits, does that mean you're not loving those sojourners? Um, and how can you love if you, if it is an open border policy, then in the end, you're not loving even the sojourner because of the chaos it might create for the country. I, I think, you know, from a Christian perspective and ultimately I think even what is most loving from a natural law perspective, like what's best for a human civilization, for a society, having some immigration is, you know, if, especially if it's from a population that is aligned largely of the values. Of course, if you're dealing with totally conflicting values, that's a problem. But I think historically it's when we are, we err on the side of generosity as opposed to restriction. Again, considering that we're talking about people that are going to want to assimilate with at least the law values and want to be proud to be American, work hard, all of these things. I think the extent, do you, would you agree? What do you think about this? That an extension, if we can have a strong border, if we can look at our immigration policy and err on the side of not extreme generosity, where we are just, you know, there's no, there's no caps. You can have endless people come in from any country, as long as they do the paperwork, that's one extreme versus we're going to you know, shrink it down to a very, very small group of people, where would you land in terms of how much legal immigration yeah. you would support? Yeah. I think that if we stopped the flow of illegal immigration altogether, we conducted mass deportations primarily focused on criminal offenders, again, in addition to the crime of crossing the border illegally, especially violent mm-hmm. offenders, those who are stirring off this gang violence in many of the cities that we see, Dallas, Denver, and several others, like let's prioritize that. I think if we got to that point, I would see that as a massive win. And I think one, I think the courts wouldn't be weighed down as much. There wouldn't be as much of this bottleneck. And we could actually have like a much more sane and civil conversation about the nuances of who we should let in. Because that is where I don't think that the Bible is black and white. I think it's pretty black and white that we shouldn't have people here illegally and that we should have strong borders. Where we can have a nuanced discussion is Mm -hmm. how many people do we let in Mm -hmm. and what are the parameters for that? Mm -hmm. And I don't know that I have the black and white answer of the exact number of people we should let in and what every you know, question on the questionnaire should be, but I would be excited to have that conversation Mm -hmm. in good faith debates and discussions Mm -hmm. about that. I don't think that there is a good faith discussion to have about whether or not we should have enforced borders. I agree. We need borders. I think we're on the same page. And I think most people agree with that. You know, even people on the left, I think a lot of people, of course, even Kamala Harris is going to the border and claiming we need a stronger border. So even the left is saying a lot of that. I I have to ask, because you just, you just noted, and I want to understand it better. And then I know we've got to wrap soon, but okay. your um, your comment about deportations, deporting people with criminal histories, I think most people can get behind that. It's like mm-hmm. you, you're coming here, you're you're committing you know violence, you're you're theft, whatever it is. Uh, a deportation is on, on, in order for the safety, quite frankly, of the community. But when you're dealing with a nonviolent defender who maybe has been here a decade, again, right, the story of someone who came here very young or they were brought here very very young is your position on Mm. that mass deportation Mm. for all of those people? Because they are deeply embedded in our communities and they have families, many of them. 
Well, I think childhood arrivals, I mm-hmm. think the definition could change because right now childhood arrivals is mm-hmm. 18 and under, I believe, or maybe under 18. I would probably put it a little bit lower than that. And I do think that we could have compassion for those who were literally brought here by no will of their own. Maybe they were brought here as a newborn and they were raised here and they really are American. Now, the other side of that is people will say, well, that just incentivizes illegal immigration because people bring their children here knowing that Mm -hmm. they're going to get shielded from deportation and that they're going to be able to live here. But to your argument, that's the importance of the strong border. That's the importance of the strong border. But I understand Mm -hmm. like right now we have young children Mm -hmm. who are here. It's also, I mean, of course, if they're still young children, you're probably going to deport them with their parents. You're not going to, I don't want family separation, true Mm -hmm. family separation. So I don't want the parents to be deported and the child to stay here and to be placed into foster care. But if there are say teenagers here who were brought here as a baby, and this is all they know, I mean, that would be really hard for me Mm -hmm. to get behind deportation of those kinds of people that part I would say is more complicated and nuanced, but in general, I believe mm-hmm. that no one should be here who is mm-hmm. illegally here for the sake for the sake of our country and the sake of our fellow citizens. It's not that you hate the people who are not here legally. It's that God placed you here providentially. He didn't place you in another country. He placed you here. And your citizenship does mean something. I think countries are like families. You lock your door at night. You have walls in your house, Mm -hmm. not because you hate your neighbors, but because you love your kids. Mm -hmm. You don't allow strangers to come into your house and eat all your Mm -hmm. kids' food and sleep on their bed while they starve and sleep on the floor. Mm -hmm. And it's not because you hate those strangers. It's because you love your kids. And God gave you your kids to steward. Mm -hmm. God gave you your kids to take care of. That doesn't mean you don't also take care of others, but never at the expense of your own children, because that would make you a cruel parent. And I really think that countries are like Mm -hmm. families. We actually do not have the capacity as fallible and finite human beings to have equal Mm -hmm. compassion and equal love, equal empathy for Mm -hmm. all people at all times. Besides love of the church, like love of family or love of country is about Mm -hmm. as big as it can get. Mm -hmm. And Chesterton actually said very, I think it's controversial today, but He said, and I'm going to kind of butcher this quote, I put it in my book, but it was, he said he doesn't want foreigners to take over his country for the same reason that he doesn't want someone to burn his house down because he wouldn't even be able to enumerate all of the Mm -hmm. things he would miss. We forget in America that a country is a shared culture. America does have a culture. It matters. It does have shared values. Those things matter. And all immigration debates, I think, should be talked about not only through the prism of compassion, but through that prism as well. I think if we have this porous border and there's people that have been here for decades, especially, or they come here very young, this is where it gets very tough when it comes to public policy, because it might sound easy to say, well, just deport everyone who's here, here who's undocumented. But we're talking about families. We're talking about children. You know, we're not just talking about violent offenders, right? Of course, there are, those exist too, right? As you talk about in your book, but as you just said, it's very tough when you're talking about a kid, when you're talking about a, a family and and the separation of that family. If there was a mass deportation and the cultural chaos yeah. that would ensue, there yeah. are other consequences if we do mass deportation, which we but haven't fully explored on the show. Also, which I know you agree, yeah. but illegal immigration also separates families. Yeah, of course, you know? yeah, there, there's that already there, separates families, and there's yeah. kids being trafficked. Like before, we even talk mm. about well, what mm. happens with the kid who might get deported or the yeah. kid who came here? I'm like, well, okay. Before we talk about yeah. that hypothetical, let's talk about the kids that are yeah. being sex trafficked across we're, the border. Oh, we're in agreement, Allie. Yeah, that we need a stronger border. Yeah, that is there is no disagreement there. I think the part that is really tough for people. And it's tough for me is some of the, you know, the language signal coming from people on, you know, some of not the all right, but some of the right, this idea of mass deportations of Mm. all anybody here who's undocumented. And I think the cultural impact of that is beyond maybe what they realize when they say that maybe it sounds good. Let's get everyone here who's here has to be paperwork has to be perfect. But if we're talking about families, young, young children who are brought here, people who have been here for decades right? And have built, been, maybe they're paying taxes, you know, they're, they're part of their economy. They're being employed by citizens. You know, they're part of this economy, right? Maybe they're not able to vote, but they are part of the economy. What is the just solution there? 
And I have a hard time seeing as just, you know, wave the wand, round everybody up and ship them out. I don't know yeah. that that is the, That's not gonna, the right I, solution. I doubt that it's going to happen just because logistically. But it's like, what are we calling? Exactly. You're exactly right. Logistically. Lo logistically, yeah. it's probably not going mm -hmm. to happen. And ICE would have its work cut out mm -hmm. for them if they just focused on the violent criminals alone. But again, when you allow for illegal immigration and you allow someone to basically treat America like an economic mm -hmm. playground, you're not voting, mm -hmm. maybe you're not contributing in other ways, you didn't have enough respect for the country to enter illegally, then you are incentivizing that dangerous mm -hmm. trek. You are incentivizing that for other mm -hmm. people. And there is a conversation to be had about how we do balance compassion for real people with real families, with real stories, with real roots here. And, and understanding the that the like role of the government, as we read in Romans 13, which was instituted by God, is to execute justice against the wrongdoer and to reward those who do good. And so what does sovereignty actually look like? What does compassionate but righteous and good and consistent? Because also justice, according to God, is impartial. It doesn't show favoritism towards some people and then is harsher towards others because that's not truthful, that's not proportionate, that's not right. And so we also have to look at the principles of justice as well. And that doesn't mean that we always negate mercy, but it does mean that if we're talking about like the government's role in this, we have to look at a consistent mm -hmm. approach to immigration enforcement. And I'm not saying that's easier that I have mm -hmm. figured all of that out, certainly, but I would hope that people, I wanna at least get people to the point of thinking harder about this. It's not just about the sad stories about the mom getting deported because she was here illegally. It is also about the human cost on the other side of this issue. I think we're in agreement that we need a strong border. And I think we're in agreement, and a lot of people are, that if you're a violent offender and you're not documented, you're here and you're not documented, then that seems like a no-brainer deportation if you're out here you know, creating chaos. I think where there's, you know, as you said, there's a lot of, you know, challenging conversations that need to happen, uh, but logistically all the people that might be here that are, you know, not the violent yeah. offenders, like you're saying, but it is came unjust for, came for, when you think yeah. about like the illegal immigrants who are here. I have another friend who is here on a student mm -hmm. visa and even if she can't even transfer schools, mm -hmm. if she wants to, because if she has a second yeah. where she is like she's not actually actively enrolled in school. She right. could get deported back to Africa. Whereas there are people here mm. illegally who yeah. don't have that fear because yeah. they don't have it's documents. Tough. It's tough. And yeah. that is also yeah. an injustice. Yes, I agree. It's very complex. Ali, where can people find your book? Yeah. Thank you for putting all that hard work into it. And you have, again, I think the toxic empathy concept is such a, a crucial one for people to navigate these issues. Yes, Toxic Empathy, How Progressives Exploit Christian Compassion. They can get it wherever books are sold. They can get it on Amazon. That's probably the best and easiest place to get it. Um, I talk about it a lot on Relatable, and that's available wherever you listen to or watch your podcasts. Thanks, Allie. Thanks Thank for you. being a voice of true, a lot of true compassion, especially on life and family. It's so needed. Thank you. A huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the largest religious network reaching millions of people with the truth of the faith, entertainment, and news. Check them out at EWTN.com.